I would like to hand over, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to somebody whose warmth and amazing uh, bubbly personality has had a hand, a very, very firm hand in shaping the dynamic, engaged community that the South African Scrum and Agile community is for bringing a disruptive element to, <laughs> to the agile thinking that makes us a group of incredibly forward-thinking agilists. Um, Karen, thank you very much. So, so since Steve uh, started this, I've, I was told last night in the bar when I... Can you not hear it? Can you hear it now? Can, can you not hear me? <laughs> That's an excuse to talk louder. So um, I got told when I accepted to talk as the keynote in the bar last night that I would have dancing girls because, you know, we should all have dancers. So I am going to have some music for my dancing girls now. And um, feel free to join them for our song. And I should unmute my machine. Well, I don't know, because my mic might go a little funny, but, you know. It might seem crazy what I'm about to say. Odyssey, and I discovered this morning that I can't spell Odyssey without looking at my name tag. It's a really strange <laughs> word. Um, so, in, in case you missed the announcement and the program, I, I am not, I don't, can't even say her name, Belikis. I'm a, a little bit paler, and I didn't need a visa to get here because I'm local. I like to think that they asked me to speak for a reason other than that I was the only person in the bar at 9 o'clock last night when the speaker cancelled. <laughs> let's, let's hope that is true. Um, and so, yeah, I'm an Agile coach and trainer at Growing Agile, and that's me on Twitter, and that's Logan, my baby. Um, and at first when Cara asked me, I thought, oh, well, I better check with Sam because we always do presentations together. And then those of you who know me, I like to talk, right? And I was like, wow, I get a whole room full of people listening to me for an hour. Why would I share that with Sam? For a whole hour, she can't tell me to shut up or be quiet or anything. So 
this is my talk. <laughs> I did promise her about a month ago that I was never going to speak on my own again, and that didn't last very long. So, so then I was like, okay, a keynote. Hmm, never done one of those before. Um, they're supposed to like tie into the theme of the conference and stuff, right? And I can't just facilitate an exercise because Steve kind of already did that. Um, so let me talk about this Odyssey thing. So I thought about, well, what is an Odyssey? And we've heard it already. It's some kind of a journey. So, so what kind of journey could I talk about? And so I thought of two stories, really, two journeys. And so that's what I want to talk about today is, is two journeys that have happened over the last 10 years. And one of them is my journey. Okay, I'm just going to... <laughs> Karen leaks, okay? I get very emotional. And she's getting emotional, so it happens. <laughs> Deal with it. Um, <laughs> and, the, and the podium may leak in a second. Um, so my journey and then our journey together. Now I see what you did. Um, and then finally, I'm going to share three tips for your journey. Okay, so let's start with me. So my journey with Agile started as a happy accident. So I was a developer, um, not a very good one, by the way. I was working with Leon at the time, actually. <laughs> he can attest to how I wasn't a very good developer. <laughs> and I interviewed for a job. This was in 2002. I hadn't even heard of Agile, although the manifesto had been signed. <laughs> and I interviewed at a company called Workshare, and they were starting a Cape Town office, and they said, we do extreme programming. And I went, okay. I think I heard someone mention that before. I don't really know what it means, but okay. And they started off with behind six people, and I was interviewing as a developer, and they said to me, we'd really like someone to be this thing that they're calling the on-site customer. It's kind of like a product owner role, if you know XP. And we're not really sure who to hire for the role or how to hire it, but they told us it should be someone organized and you dress the neatest for the interview. <laughs> so would you like to do that job? And I went, okay, I'll give it a try. I found out later that one of the developers came to the interview with, with food on his shirt, so. <laughs> Neat was all relative. He did used to come in in like, his, his um, wetsuit, I'm like, Cara, what are those things you surf in? His wetsuit and his surfboard under his arm for the rest of the job. So I worked there for two and a half years in what, in hindsight, I realized was utopia. We literally had one desk per two people. We only pair worked. We worked on a code base and a product from the first line of code using TDD. We had a continuous integration server from day one um, we actually had an XP coach who flew out from the UK to train us for the first four weeks. Um, and I didn't know what I had. I was like, oh, this is okay, but I'm kind of annoyed and bored and it's time to move on. So after two and a half years, I moved on. And um, it, it was trial by Gantt chart. Um, I became a project manager because, you know, I'd been kind of this project program. My title was program manager at Workshare. So I became a project manager, and I went to work for um, SES, Safmarine Computer Services, that then later got bought by IBM. So if you heard any of Gitter's IBM stories, think that. Um, and I became a PMP, and I'm a Prince2 practitioner, and I did all of that stuff. And I worked on a lot of projects. And I even worked on a project where I found out that there was an error in the contract because the contract kind of, the deliverables were over December, January. And so the contract date was out by a year. We'd missed the, basically, we said we'll deliver in 2014, and I'd written 2015 in the contract. And we still missed the date. <laughs> so we were a year late, and we still missed the date. And this was a fixed price contract with 20 people on it. So you can imagine the kind of loss that was. So I was like, OK, well, this isn't working. And then I worked with a team there, and we got a small team that were working together, and we got data on our estimates and our actuals. And then I delivered my crown and glory as a project manager. I delivered a project one week early because it didn't need a second drop into UAT because our code was that good that they couldn't find any bugs in UAT. And we delivered on budget. Awesome, right? Crowning success. Utter failure because not a single business user used it because no one asked them when we built it. 
they didn't want it. So I was like, okay, so this doesn't work even if we get all the stuff right that I was supposed to get right as a project manager. So I give up. And, and so I moved on. I actually was planning to move out of um, IT completely and, and move into finance. So I went to work at JP Morgan. This is where I first encountered the word Scrum of Scrums. They weren't doing Scrum, but they had Scrum of Scrums. And what a Scrum of Scrum was, in JP Morgan terms, this is not correct, um, was a two-hour meeting twice a week in a meeting room where you sat down <laughs> with 20 project managers, analysts, business owners, etc. Anyone guess how many developers were on this project? Four. <laughs> We had a scrum of scrums with 20 project managers and analysts and whatever. You can imagine why nothing happened. So I decided, okay, this is wrong, and I know it's wrong, and I've only been here three months, but I can already tell it's wrong, but I'm going to take my time finding the next job. So I did. I took, it took four months. I was at J.P. Morgan for seven months. It took four months, and I found home. I found a new place. I went in as a project manager. They were all very excited because they'd never seen a highlight report before, so Prince 2 to the rescue. And about six months in, there was a new head of R&D, and she said, I want to do Scrum. And I was like, okay, I'll go read about that. And I went home, and I read Henrik Nieberg's Scrum and XP from the Trenches. It's like a little mini, free mini book. It's about 20 pages. And I went, that's like that XP thing I used to do. I can do this. I can roll that out to 100 people. No problem. Went back on Monday. Yes, of course I can do that. Um, so our version of training was a one-hour PowerPoint, death by PowerPoint. They were not hand-drawn. And um, that was the training a team got. I think Johan was there. <laughs> and then they started their sprints. And um, I kicked off a team every two weeks, because we were doing two-week sprints, until I kicked off all nine teams in 18 weeks. Done. <laughs> Tick. <laughs> um, a really interesting thing happened at this time, which is completely accidentally, my husband, Carlo, who some of you know, was also getting involved in the Scrum thing. And he heard about this course called the CSM. He said, well, I'm going to go on this course. Do you want to go on this course? I was like, oh, well, I guess I can go. I kind of know everything about Scrum, but I can go on the course. Um, and, and Peter will remember that as, what, what was it, like the second or third CSM? Yeah, that Boris did. And funnily enough, Sam was on the same course, but I never met her. Um, and on that course, I kind of went, oh, Oh, Scrum is not about having a 15-minute meeting and doing da, 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 and micromanaging and organizing everybody and wow, emergence, self-organization, other stuff. I've gotten it completely wrong. So, is he now get emotional again? <laughs> so then, I knew I had to learn more about this agile thing. And Peter convinced me to go to a sorry. <laughs> But overseas gathering. No! <laughs> that doesn't make physical sense. <laughs> but then more will come out, Cara. Um, so Peter convinced me to go to an overseas gathering. It was actually so that we could plan the first gathering here. He's like, you need to go and experience it. And so I went along and I met Lisa Atkins, who changed my life, literally. Sorry. So I discovered through her, kind of a bit like, get the story. She, she tells it better than I do without the tears. <laughs> um, that besides this agile thing, and besides the scrum thing, and this empowering teams thing, there's this thing called coaching. And it's not about telling people what to do. And it's not about judging people. And it's not about of trying to control anything anymore. But it's about letting people be the best thing they can be. And I realized how badly I stuffed up at Intech. <laughs> Into the hasty exit. <laughs> <laughs> so I fled the scene of the crime. I was really unhappy. I was acting out as only the anarchist in me can and blaming the organization and finding all the reasons why it had failed there not wanting to face that I'd failed as a coach because I didn't know anything about managing change. And I didn't really understand how difficult this stuff is. I'd done it before and it was easy. I didn't realize all the things I had in place that made it easy. So I left. And 
And the next day they retrenched Sam. <laughs> they were trying to get rid of everything that we brought there. And I, I take responsibility for that now. But. I moved on to a wonderful safe playground um, at Fundamo. I had a boss who really got agile. And he let me do what I wanted to do. Yes? No. <laughs> Although they do do it now, so maybe it was. <laughs> um, so Richard let me try experiments with these teams. We, had, um, we changed from kind of two to three teams, went up to about four teams, and I tried everything I'd ever read about, and I tried all the coaching techniques I'd learned from Lisa, and I was um, being coached by her through kind of remote coaching at the time. And I really found a place where Scrum could work. We had awesome teams. They were deliver delivering regularly. We fixed our um, quality issues. We fixed a radical overtime issue that after I'd worked there for the first three weekends, I realized that they'd worked overtime for the last, like, nine months, and everybody was exhausted. And I said, no more. And Richard let me say no more. And we didn't do any more overtime, and things got better, and they were awesome. And it was about a year and a half later, in my happy, lovely land, when Visa bought them, and I knew it wasn't going to stay the same, and I knew I had to leave. So I did leave, um, but I also left to move on. I thought I'd learned the lessons I could learn at Fundamo. I didn't really want to learn them in a big corporate environment. A and so Sam and I formed Growing Agile. This was three years ago. In fact, our domain registration just came up, so I know it's been almost exactly three years. And what, what we did was we formed a company where we can live the agile values in everything we do. So we constantly experiment. We change what we do. We look at what do we want to do. We set up an experiment. We do it. We do retrospectives regularly. We try, you know, all these techniques we're using, story maps, whatever. We try it on our own stuff. We've taken things. We've taken training. We've turned them into books. We've tried online training. We've tried remote training. We've tried coaching via Google Hangout. And... We don't do Scrum or Kanban or whatever. We just live those principles. And that's really helped us do what we do. But it's not the end of the journey. So we are still experimenting and learning and shaping things and figuring out where we go. But this is really where I've gotten to with Agile. And it used to be a little bit of a Scrum zealot. Okay, a lot of a Scrum zealot. Now I get that it's about a lot more and it's a lot deeper. So, let's talk about our journey. And I was chatting to Alvin this morning. Where's Alvin? About should our journey be the journey of the Sagsa community, or should it be the journey of Scrum in South Africa? And he kind of said to me, well, they're kind of interlinked, aren't they? It's the same story. So that's the story I want to tell. If I think back to when I started at Workshare in 2002, it was pretty much all DIY, Scrum or XP. Actually, XP was quite, quite common then. And so some people read some books, and they tried some stuff themselves, and it was mostly in little small companies, and people had some success or not. But there really, you couldn't go anywhere for Scrum training in South Africa. And you couldn't, you know, go find people who had experience doing this. Um, so really, people who were interested were doing it for themselves. And then we were lucky enough to have an explorer, someone who went, I'm, I, this is interesting stuff. I want to know more about this, and we don't have it here. So I'm going to go out on a mission to Europe, and I'm going to find out what they're doing, and I'm going to bring it back. And so that person was Peter. And I have an experiment I want to do right now. I don't know how it's going to go. Have you all heard of the Kevin Bacon effect? <laughs> so you can link people by like six degrees of freedom, Kevin Bacon and all actors in movies. So I'm going to try the Peter Hundemark effect. <laughs> so, so what I want to do is ask Peter to stand. Okay. Now, if you know Peter, if you've met him, if you've been on a course, if you've worked with him, then I want you to stand. And this includes me, because obviously I know Peter. Right, okay. So now, if you don't know Peter personally, but you know somebody who's now standing, please stand. Okay, so that's two degrees. Anyone still sitting? One person. Two people. Okay, if you know someone who is now standing, please stand. That's three degrees. 
Okay. There's a little black hole over there. What? There's a black hole in the corner. If if I went to another degree, would you would you would there be more people? They are, now you are, okay. So Peter, could you just go meet those people over there? Because then <laughs> Then we could prove that actually we're connected by about three degrees in the South African scrum community. And I think that's important because I think if I look at our journey, it talks a little bit to why we've progressed as quickly as we have. And I'll get to this at the end, but I think we used to lag behind the states in Europe by about five to ten years, and I think we're about two to three years behind now. So I think we've radically seen growth in our community and our knowledge and our application of Scrum and Agile, and I think it's because of the strong community we have. Having been overseas, they do not have groups this rich and this interconnected over there. They're all in little cities all over, and there's like a user group of 20 people, and that's it. So what do we have is special. So back to my, my story. Um, so after the CSM and after um, Peter brought back Boris, there were some scrum fanatics. I was one of them. Please note, those of you who know Boris, I used his color scheme for the slide. <laughs> he only uses orange, black, and gray. <laughs> he also introduced us all to Neuland markers, which is a wonderful thing. <laughs> so any, who knows Boris in the room? Boris Gloger. Okay, so see, there's still quite a few people. Um, so Boris came in and did the first CSMs before, before Peter was qualified, and he really, he's a special guy, and he really kind of took some of us who were the early adopters and made us fanatics. Maybe a little too fanatical, because right there, that's when I went back and said, you could only do Scrum the one way, the Boris way, and that is the only way. And perhaps, <laughs> perhaps I wasn't as kind to some people as I should have been. Um, but, but that was a phase, and I think that's normally what happens with early, um, early adopters. And after that, what happened is all our Scrum fanatics went on and went, you have to do the CSM. It's a life-changing course. It's so awesome. Go do it. It's awesome. I certainly did a lot of that. And so the CSM became very popular, um, and we saw a lot of people doing CSMs and going in. Uh, and that was great. We were spreading this knowledge of Scrum. I still think that the course offered in its two days so much more than what you could get from a book, and you were getting experience from people who have been doing it, so that was awesome. But in my mind, it kind of, and oh, so I wanted to add, and around this time is when the Sugsa <coughs> community started as well. So, um, and Peter also started that up, and I got involved very early, and we started a community, we started having events, and I think it was, I was trying to, 2009, we had the first Scrum Day, it's around then, so that was the first conference day like this, and so that all started building, but in my mind, it led to this, and I'm, I'm a culprit of this too, which was thinking that after a two-day course, you could implement Scrum in an organization. In fact, I thought I could do it after reading a 20-page book. Um, but I think what I started to see was a few people on a CM, CSM would get it, which, and the it that they got was, we can't do this alone, this is really difficult. Um, and I think that started to happen, but for a long time there was a lot of people trying to do it themselves who didn't have experience, and it led to a lot of bad Scrum, and it led to a lot of developers who hate Scrum, and a lot of developers are like, I'm never going to do that again because it's really crap, and it's just for managers to micromanage me, I get that. Um, but I think that changed, and we started seeing people who said we need help. I remember Sam and I getting one, one of our very first clients in Growing Agile was people who, a small company who'd done Scrum themselves, and it had failed horribly. And they went, you know what, if we're going to get this right, and we have to get it right, otherwise we're going to go out of business, we need help. So people started looking for training and looking for coaching. And I think that was a good sign that people recognized this stuff was hard. They tried it once, didn't really work, they'd asked for some help. Sam says my picture here is not very clear. It's supposed to be the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> um, she didn't draw the pictures, and normally she draws the pictures, so uh, I apologize, but you get the idea. So, so Scrum started to be successful in some small companies, particularly small teams, and, and big corporates got hold of this and went, it's no longer the lunatic fringe doing this. We want some of that. And so some pilots started in... in um, large companies and things started to get difficult and enter a few words like safe and dad and I'm not even going to comment on those, Austin. He just smiles. Um, but we started to realize this is a bigger problem when it's happening at scale and it's happening in corporates that have a lot of 
rules and regulations and whatever. At the same time, because we started realizing this was a hard problem, I think the Saxa community started doing things like more regular meetings, we started coaching circles, we started helping each other out, more of the community started talking, we started sharing some stories. And from that, what's happened for me is that the community of coaching and the number of people who call themselves agile coaches and the number of companies now selling agile coaching services has kind of blossomed, I would say, in the last two years. So before, when there was like two people you could go to, there's now probably 50, guessing. Um, and so this is growing. And I think it's a good thing because I think it's representing the market, realizing we need help with this stuff. It is hard. And there's, I, I still think there's more work for agile coaches than there are agile coaches. And slowly what we're starting to see is companies coming to us and they don't just go, please train us in Scrum. They go, we would like to do Scrum. How do you suggest you help? Or what's the best way to do that? And what's even more interesting for me is that the question has changed to please help us do Scrum to we already do this, but we need some help to improve. Or we'd like to know how we could do stuff better. It's led for us to having recurring clients. So clients where we go and do something different every month because we're like, are we ready for a new technique? Or, well, we've kind of mastered that Scrum thing now, but we're struggling with our requirements. Can we talk a little bit about how to do that better? Or got that all going, but how can we improve our testing? And so realizing that Agile is this huge space that you can continually grow in. It's not you do it once and then that's it, you're done. Um, so that's a really exciting sign for me. So where are we? This is the kind of the adoption curve. Jeffrey Moore? Yes? Yes? Um, it's kind of early adopters and then early majority, late majority. You may disagree with me. I think in South Africa we, we are now in the late majority. I don't think there's a big corporate that I know of that hasn't at least had a pilot or trial of Scrum that are not running some teams doing that. Most small companies that we meet are either running it or trying some version of it. So I think we are in the late majority. I think we're at the place where we can accept that Scrum is the way we're going to be working going forward. So how can we get better at it? Because I think, I think we can still get better and I think it's an ongoing journey. So, and as I said, I think we used to be 10 years behind. I think we're catching up really, really quickly. And so if we keep going at this rate, we can be world leaders here. Something else that's happened in the community in the last two or three years is that we've started making a presence on the global stage. So now it's not just Peter or me or Sam going overseas. Kara's going and speaking. Pavel's going and speaking. So we're representing our community globally, and that's awesome. So what can you do? Your journey. So I think it would be nice for each of you at this conference to add to the story of South Africa. And so I know that you've all been through two days and you've got these really long lists of things to do. So I'm just going to give you three. Hopefully you can do them. They'll help you with what you've learned so far. And the first one um, um, is really interesting because this came up in a session this morning. So if you need a definition of entropy, uh, I believe Wayne and Kevin Trithui are the experts. Oh, and Dani can help you with that too. I'm not going to explain entropy. I'm going to tell you a story. And what I mean by entropy is that without continuous attention to how you're doing and how Scrum is doing, you will decay. You will get worse. So remember how proud I was of Fundama and how awesome we did there? Was it last week, Sam? Last week, I went to a talk, a spin talk, by Carol May, who's now the head of delivery at Visa, ex Fundama. And she told a story about their journey with SAFE over the last 10 months. And it was quite an interesting story. And I, I was polite about SAFE, Austin, I was. <laughs> and then she got to her final slide. And I looked at the slide and I went, that's the same slide I had three years ago. Defect rate from 600 down to zero. Releases no longer, weren't predictable, now are predictable. And I was like, but I solved this problem three years ago. And what I realized is I did solve it three years ago. And then it came back because I left. And no one else was looking at it. And probably, I said to Carol, I said, well, what happens when you leave? And she said, I haven't got the answer because she doesn't know either. She's going to leave 
she's the person who is paying attention to it, they're going to lose that battle again and again and again. So unless we keep paying attention to this stuff and we keep having internal champions, you're going to keep going backwards. I, I don't want to be like <laughs> the voice of gloom. I sound like Carlo now. Um, but <laughs> his version is Agile's all fucked. You're all fucked. It's just fucked. <laughs> He is no longer an agile coach, just so you know. Um, so that's, that's his slide. Um, my, my slide is that the best weapon you have against this entropy is learning. And I mean, I learned lots of stuff that's helped my journey, but I'm still learning. And what's interesting is as a community and as a global community, we're still learning. So we're discovering how to do things in corporates now that we didn't know a while ago. I read a book recently called Continuous Agile that talks about a fully distributed team with people in every country who have never met and the way they communicate is through their commits to source control and it frickin' works. And I was like, I never would have guessed that that would work, but it does. It goes against everything in my core, but it works. So we're finding new ways of doing this the whole time and the only way you're gonna stay relevant and you're gonna figure out how to do this is if the number one thing you and your team are doing is learning. And I don't just mean setting aside two days to come to a conference like this, which is great, but you have to set aside time when you get back to do something differently with what you've learned. Because if you learn it and you don't use it, you didn't really learn it. So spend some time, figure out how are you gonna use what you've learned. And then the last one is join in. So it's really funny when, I, when we start coaching, particularly at big companies, and all I hear is, but I can't change this, but I can't do this, but I can't, but I can't, but I can't. And, and you can't change anyone except yourself. And so my message is, just start with you and what's possible. And, and stop finding the reasons you can't do stuff and start finding the reasons you can do something. Because you can do something. Um, so I have one gift for you, and that is time. So I'm going to end by the program an hour early by, by what I think was supposed to be half an hour early. And what I'd like you to do with this gift of time is to decide how you want to change your journey and what you want to do differently with what you've learned today. Thank you. And thank you for... Yeah. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.